Welcome back to Orthodoxy Live. I have missed seeing all of you here each Sunday evening, but I'm excited for the future of this program, which in the coming weeks will be offered periodically in both the Serbian and English languages. For those new to our live program, however, welcome. This is an ongoing mission that is a collaboration between the Departments of Christian Education and of Internet Ministries for the Eastern American Diocese of the Serbian Orthodox Church, with the blessing of His Grace Bishop Irene. Our goal each week is to bring interesting speakers and guests to share a little bit about the Orthodox faith with the world. And today, our guest speaker is Dr. Nikola Rosanovich, who will be speaking on the topic, Music as a Bridge Between Language and Our Orthodox Worship Services. So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Rasanovich live from Ohio. Good evening. Welcome to Orthodoxy Live. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Father Alexa. Hey, it is good to have you here with us, uh, truly. I've known you for a few years uh, as we've run into each other at Monastery Marcha, uh, always faithfully singing uh, with that community, but throughout many of our churches here in the uh, Cleveland Deanery. Uh, but for those of you connected with the <clears throat> world of music, you're likely familiar with Dr. Rasanovich. His music, having been played at hundreds of festivals and concert halls all over the world, and I mean all over the world, on the six inhabited continents, if I uh, did read correctly, uh, his compositions have been played by the official orchestras and symphonies in Cleveland, Jacksonville, Toledo, uh, Greater Palm Beach, Akron, Mansfield, Lima, and so many more. Uh, but I am most familiar with Dr. Rasanovich from even before I met him for the first time, uh, when a friend of mine at seminary, when I asked him to help me learn Serbian chant, uh, and about a week later, he brought me the Osmoglossnik, the book of the eight tones, in which Dr. Rasanovich applied English text to Serbian chant. That book enabled me and countless others to engage in the rich musical tradition of the Serbian church in a way that was accessible to us. But his work on the sacred chant of the Serbian Orthodox Church goes far beyond the Book of the Eight Tones. His anthology of Serbian chant, the music of the Divine Liturgy, Great Vespers, the hymns of the Paschal and Festal Cycles, they are absolute treasures to the world of Orthodoxy, and through a great deal of hard work, have been made available online with audio examples to assist in learning. And I did put a link down there for anybody that is interested to visit. Uh, for his great contributions to the Serbian Orthodox Church, uh, Dr. Rasanovich has been awarded the Order of St. Sava, third degree, in addition to other awards and honors he has received. Dr. Rasanovich uh, was a professor of music at the University of Akron, the School of Music, where he taught composition and theory from 1983 until his retirement in 2018. He is presently Professor Emeritus at the University of Akron. And tonight, Dr. Rasanovich will be uh, speaking on a topic that affects the life of worship for many of us Orthodox Christians living here in America and throughout the world, music as a bridge between language and our Orthodox worship services. But before he begins, I'd like to remind all of you out there that the goal of Orthodoxy Live is not only to prevent topics live to all of you, but it's to offer a forum for interaction and engagement. So be sure to post your questions in the comments. I'll be monitoring them, and I'm monitoring that live feed throughout the talk. And if your question is on topic and appropriate, we will present it to Dr. Rasanovich to answer. All that being said, uh, Dr. Rasanovich, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a gospel uh, quote. Um, this is from Matthew uh, chapter 26 verse 30, and it reads, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And we see that same verse in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, this scriptural verse suggests to us that Christ himself very likely sang 
uh, him together with his 11 remaining disciples, Judas already having left them in order to betray him. The location of this passage within the gospel narrative is especially important as it immediately follows the Last Supper at which the Eucharist was instituted. And it's immediately followed by the passion, betrayal, suffering, and crucifixion of our Lord. Now, the Gospels do not reveal to us the hymn that was sung. It may have been one of the Psalms. It may have been a special Passover hymn. Nevertheless, the singing of this hymn in and of itself is a kind of bridge between these two very important events in the life of our Lord, which, although separated in time, are inseparably linked to one another. In this one verse, the Gospel of St. Matthew and of St. Mark seem to place the act of communal worship at the center of the Eucharist on the one hand and the passion, betrayal, and crucifixion on the other. This singing was, in fact, the final activity of Christ together with his disciples prior to their all being scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And it underscores for us the importance and centrality of both music and text in Christian worship. They sung a hymn. The word sung is especially significant because it speaks to the role that music plays in the act of communal worship. To understand the importance of this, let's try a simple thought experiment. Imagine a group of, say, 12 people reciting a prayer together. This is something we Orthodox Christians would likely experience at every liturgy, at the reciting of the Creed or the Lord's Prayer. We hear many different voices with differing inflections, slightly varying rhythmic cadences, each person stressing and articulating the words and sentences in a slightly different way. We might hear some individuals begin the next sentence before others have finished the previous one. It is that characteristic group sound in which the vowels are kept short following the manner of speech. Now imagine that same group singing the same prayer. A melody is now heard, and perhaps with a few individuals harmonizing as they're able. We hear a completely different kind of sound one in which the vowels are extended in time, either with sustained notes or with added flourishes. We hear a more unified rhythm. We hear stronger voices supporting weaker voices. We hear weaker voices leaning on stronger voices. The prayer now becomes a unified expression of all the people involved. We're no longer aware of a group or crowd of voices, but we hear instead a choir a chorus of voices. The melody, and by extension, the harmony, has accomplished two important things. It has unified the voices vertically by combining them around a single pitch or a single chord or tonality. And it has unified the voices horizontally in time by providing a consistent rhythm and meter for all to follow. We now see that the sung hymn between Christ and his disciples was embellishing that which already existed, a community of souls in worship, the embryonic church. As they process to the Mount of Olives, Christ the Logos and his disciples were united in worship. The hymn they sang was an expression of that unity, while the music, the singing, was an outward manifestation, an adornment of that expression. We now understand the importance of music in communal worship. Let's try another thought experiment. Imagine that God gave you alone the ability to go back in time to hear Christ singing with his disciples. Now imagine that you are brought back to our time so that you can share that experience with us. I dare say that if you're like most people, you would probably return from the past to tell us that while it was beautiful and inspirational to see and hear Christ and his disciples sing, you couldn't understand a single word. And you're even at a loss to know what was being sung. But again, if you're like most people, 
you'd very likely be able to remember at least parts of the melody, especially if it was a simple and repetitive melody, as most hymn tunes often are. It's quite probable that you would remember the melody rather than any of the foreign Aramaic tongue, precisely because music, unlike Aramaic, is already familiar to you as a kind of universal language. Indeed, if you were able to remember any of the hymn texts at all, it would be only because it was set to music, and music can be a very powerful aid in memorizing. So let's be honest, in order for us and our children today to meaningfully participate in the hymn that was sung by Christ and his disciples, we would at least need a translation. That way we could pray with wor the words with understanding as St. Paul suggests in one of his epistles. And better still would be if we could set that translation to the same music that Christ and his disciples were singing then we would really be able to experience that connection with them. The music would become a sort of bridge and we would be adapting the hymn translation to the existing music. It would become a bridge, not just between the past and the present in the case of this thought experiment, but a bridge between two different languages. The meaning of the text along with the music would now be the only two common elements the music in this case would serve to reinforce that meaning by virtue of its having built an association with it. To illustrate this, imagine a group of French school children singing our American national anthem in their native French tongue. Now, even though you might not understand the French language, the moment you hear even one phrase of the music, you'll know exactly what they're singing and you know exactly what it means. That's because the music will have conveyed that meaning to you by virtue of its association with the Star Spangled Banner text. Now the translation of the hymn sung by Christ and his disciple, meaning the original going to be very different. Grammar, syntax, sentence structure, phonetic sounds, vowels, consonances, they're all going to be different between these two languages. A single syllable word in one language might require two or three syllables in order to be expressed in another language. For example, in the Church Slavonic, the word gospody is a three syllable word. But in English, it translates simply to Lord, which is a one syllable word. The process of adaptation, much like that of building real bridges, is actually fairly complex and challenging. It poses many problems and considerations for the person doing the work. And I'll illustrate some of those for you here in just a moment. So this being the case, the argument might be put forth to give the translation its own unique and new melody, sort of like putting new wine into new bottles. And of course, this can certainly be done. It's what we call musical composition. But if we stay with that metaphor, is the wine really new in this case? The translation is new, but the hymn itself, its meaning, its essence, its very spirit is timeless. And it comes from the divine logos himself. Consider also that if we did compose a new melody and translated the hymn uh, that Christ, for the translated hymn that Christ and the disciples sang, if we were to reverse our thought process so that they would now hear what we're singing in our time, uh, they wouldn't be under, able to understand uh, either what we're singing, either the music or the text, nor would they recognize any aspect of it. But if we did at least use the same melody that they sang, the melody would alone by its familiarity and association convey the meaning to the disciples. They would recognize what it is we're singing, much like the French schoolchildren singing the national anthem. The music would become 
a common bridge across time and space, uniting us in worship with Christ and his disciples. Music is indeed a universal language, but it also transcends language. For example, I don't need to be German or even understand German in order to delight in the symphonies of Beethoven. His music has the power to communicate something of beauty and value across national and cultural boundaries. It's this universality of music combined with its rather abstract nature that allows it to be so readily uh, to so readily convey meaning by association. Music can attach itself and become associated with almost anything. It can be associated with a text. It can be associated with an event, a time and a place, a person, an object, a thought or an idea, or even an emotion. Music can readily associate itself with all of these things or it can stand completely on its own. This is what makes music such a fitting bride for worship. And by this, I mean that music and text form a sort of marriage. Each has their own part to play, but bound together in worship, the text and the music form a sublime marriage, if you will. And this is why I think it's so important for us Serbian Orthodox Christians to adapt our translations to the existing Serbian chant, regardless of the language. First of all, the chant is something familiar. Secondly, these are melodies which have become sanctified by virtue of their being set aside for use in worship. Thirdly, the association of meaning that already exists between a church Slavonic hymn and its melody is reinforced when we use that same melody with a new hymn translation. Now, having said all of this, I'd like to look a bit more closely at the challenges and problems that adaptation poses. And I'm going to do this using two very short and simple examples. The first one is from uh, the hymn Slava Tebje Gospodi Slava Tebje. And the traditional melody from that is set by Mokranjac. This hymn uh, precedes the gospel and follows the gospel uh, reading uh, during the liturgy and other services. And it, it goes like this. Slava Tebje, Gospodi, Slava Tebje. Very simple setting. We're just going to take the first part of that, the first two measures. Slava Tebje, Gospodi. Now you hear there are three words in Church Slavonic. Slava, Tebje, Gospodi. The, a group of two syllables, Slava, a group of two more, Tebje, and then a group of three syllables, Gospodi. Altogether, we have seven syllables, and they're being set to seven notes, so each syllable will get its own note. Slava, Tebje, Gospodi. And you'll observe that the melody and the rhythm of the melody is fit very nicely to the rhythm of the text itself. So that works beautifully. That's a beautiful marriage between the melody, the music, and the text. Now, when we translate that, it's glory to thee, O Lord. And immediately you hear there are two very important differences, besides it being a different language. The meaning is the same, but the Accent patterns are almost reversed. You have glory to, which is a group of three, the O, a group of two, Lord, which sort of sits by itself. So three plus two plus one or two, depending on how you set it. But there's only six syllables in the translation. So if we literally try to map those six syllables onto our Serbian chant melody, it creates a problem. It's going to sound like this. Glory to the O Lord. Glory to the O Lord. You can see that we're accenting the wrong syllables when we do that. We're actually emphasizing O, which doesn't really have any importance in that text phrase. And we're de-emphasizing things like the. Uh, and it gets even worse if we try to map the word Lord onto the word Gospody 
in that short melody. Because now I have to take glory to thee and put it all in front of Lord. And it goes like this. Glory to thee, O Lord. So now I'm emphasizing Lord the way you would gospel thee. But I'm rushing glory to thee. And it sounds hurried. It sounds irreverent. So neither of those solutions work. And what you look for then is a solution that will allow the English language to be set musically the way almost it would be spoken. Glory to thee, O Lord. I want to emphasize glory, thee, and Lord. So I'm going to change the rhythm of the Serbian chant melody just slightly, but I keep all the pitches the same. Glory to thee, O Lord. And we're using the same pitches that the Mokranjac melody uses. Slava tebje, gospodi. We're only changing the rhythm, and we're changing it in order to marry that same melody, as it were, to the new text so that it is better suited to the accent patterns of the English language, and it communicates the all-important meaning of that phrase by emphasizing the right words. So that's just one short example of adaptation. And I'll share with you one other example, which is very interesting to me, because this illustrates the problem of performance. Now, uh, there's a phrase of music, Yelitsi is the hymn, Yelitsi vo Christa Krestistesia, which is as many as have been baptized into Christ. Now, this is a hymn that's normally used in, pray, in place of the Trisagion hymn, uh, during uh, many of the feasts, and it's also used during the baptism service. And the traditional Serbian chant melody goes like this. It's a beautiful tone one melody. You'll notice that the chant is set syllabically so that each note or each syllable of the text phrase pretty much gets its own unique pitch. Uh, much like the earlier example, there's a little melisma, a little flourish at the end on Christi Stesia. Now, the English translation actually works very well. As many as have been baptized into Christ, it's 11 syllables, so it has an extra syllable. But the accent patterns actually fit very nicely with the Serbian chant melody, so we don't have to touch a thing in this case. As many as have been baptized into Christ. They, they sound very similar. So here's an example of adaptation where the rhythm and the pitches of the melody are identical in both languages. So what's the problem, you might ask? Well, the problem is... Uh, with the change in the order of the words. The word Christ in the Church Slavonic appears earlier in the phrase, Yelitsi vo Christa, where in the English translation, it appear, appears at the very end, as many as have been baptized into Christ. So it's sort of the goal of that phrase. And you can't alter that order if you literally try to translate it exactly the way the Serbian is rendered, you'd get something that sounds silly, like this, as many as into Christ baptized have been. Well, that's unsingable, and it's almost unintelligible. So you have to preserve the word order the way it is in English and put Christ at the end. Now, why is that an issue? Well, if we sing the Church Slavonic version, Christa comes at the highest point in the melody, and so that is what we call a tonal accent. That lift in the melody is causing that particular word and syllable to be stressed above the others. And you would naturally want to sing it with that stress when you render it. But now when you do the English version, what word shows up in the place of Christ? As many as have. It's the word have, which in that context certainly doesn't have the same meaning or weight. We want, in the English rendition, to still put the emphasis on Christ. And so 
we don't want to sing that English translation the same way we would sing the Slavonic. We won't. We don't want to do this. As many as have been baptized, we don't want to do that. So we want to sing through the have, which means we sing it more legato, more smoothly. As many as have been baptized into Christ. And we put the emphasis naturally where it belongs on the words baptized into Christ. So that, that's a performance issue illustration where you adapt something and it fits perfectly, but you still have to render it in a different way when you perform it. You have to have that consideration in mind because the words have been moved around. And so that means that musically the meaning changes slightly and you need to be responsive to that, whether you're a choir director directing a choir or whether you're just a cantor singing it by yourself. So with those two examples and uh, that little preamble about uh, the value of adapting uh, our um, Serbian chant to uh, new translations, um, I'd like to turn it over to Father Alexa for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Rosanovich. I have to tell you, that was a fascinating and wonderful talk. It reminded me very much of some of the music courses I took at seminary when all of these things you talked about were very foreign to me. Uh, and I never stopped to consider just how much thought uh, and planning was necessary to go into good translations along with musical settings. So this was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and I am going to do my best to uh, translate them myself into a way that I think will be a, a easier to understand question here. So, with regard to music and tone, uh, people that sometimes go to, say, churches where Byzantine music is used, uh, think that the music sounds a little minor to our Western ears, even when you're talking about resurrectional and joyous music. Uh, maybe if you have a moment to discuss um, maybe how culture and our, our own ears and how we hear music can give us a different understanding of it and maybe how we might bridge that gap if we're unfamiliar and find ourselves in another church. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes, it okay. does. Um, there is that uh, tendency, I think, especially in Western music, uh, we have built a very strong association with uh, minor keys, especially at slower tempos, uh, reflecting a somber mo um, mood, and the major keys at faster tempos, uh, reflecting a, a lighter, a more happier mood. Uh, but historically, that's uh, not the case. Uh, there are many examples. It's not just Byzantine chant, but even Serbian chant, for example, uh, uh, you have the uh, the Paschal verses. Um, and if you listen to the Paschal verses, which are supposed to be very happy, right? Let, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Um, and certainly in the Russian tones, they're very quick and happy that way. Uh, but when you hear the Serbian chant melody, and I'm not familiar with the Byzantine chant, but I suppose that it would be very uh, along the same lines. Uh, but it sounds very minor and, and very somber. Um, and, uh, and again, we associate that then with something that's sad, and that's just a cultural sort of appropriation. We kind of have to get past that. Um, but th there is another solution, and, and uh, uh, I, ha I actually, for that reason, uh, in the uh, second volume of the anthology, created an alternate setting of uh, precisely those uh, Paschal hymns in a much livelier uh, major mode, which was tone six. Um, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. You know that, uh, so it's a much livelier melody than the, uh, the more melismatic uh, minor key that, that is uh, historically uh, more appropriate and more familiar. And certainly they can both be done um, I don't see uh, any issue with that, but that, that's one possible solution for sort of crossing that hurdle is, okay, um, if that minor key is not particularly suited uh, for us in our age, 
uh, either because of the minor key or the tempo. Now, maybe this is a hymn that uh, could be set um, using a different tone. If it's not something that is um, meant to only be presented in one specific tone. After all, we have that example uh, with many hymns that are presented in, you know, from week to week in different tones, like, oh, Lord, I call upon thee, hear me. And, and some weeks it's in a more major tone, some weeks it's in a minor tone, uh, some weeks it might be a slightly faster uh, moving tone, uh, some, some weeks a slightly mo a slower moving tone. Uh, so you have that sort of uh, tonal variety. Uh, you kind of have to separate that idea of mood and that association of mood uh, from uh, church music and realize that uh, things can be uh, joyful in spirit. Uh, and yet the nature of the melody is one that is reflective and sort of thoughtful and contemplative in nature, you know. So that would be kind of an, an answer that I would give you. It's a little bit of a rambling answer, but... Uh, no, that's a yeah, that's, very good answer, uh, and uh, it, I, I very much appreciated it. I'm sure the person who asked it does as well. Uh, and the next one we received, uh, and I think actually this one uh, might come from me. <laughs> At seminary, we were taught uh, to consider word importance and accenting when applying chant to text, and you, you talked about this in your two examples there at the end uh, perfectly. Uh, but I might ask, how might you advise chanters in the church uh, to prepare so that they can emphasize correctly? Uh, because it is not uncommon to see a book opened up and just the chant done. And I always wonder to myself, is the accenting falling correctly? How best do we prepare uh, to do this kind of music and chant liturgically? Is it just opening a book, or is there perhaps a method that is going to be uh, a little better for communicating effectively the text? Yeah, I think a lot there depends on the individual, actually. Uh, there are some people that um, uh, you can hand the music to for the very first time, and uh, they are able to sight-read it uh, with all the uh, proper uh, setting and accentuation and all the proper meaning and uh, i mean there are other individuals who really need to practice uh that simple uh that you maybe need to hear an example of somebody singing that if it's available to you um, online um, and then um, maybe practice it uh, that way a few times and um, it takes effort. And just like uh, many other things, some things come easier for other people, uh, for some one person, and the other person has to work very hard at it. And um, the, the important thing is the end result, uh, you know, needs to be appropriate. You, you, um, you can't be sounding in church like you're rehearsing, um, you know, and because uh, then it, it's a distraction. Um, and it, it uh, takes people then away from what you want them to be focusing on, which is prayer. And they're noticing now you struggling or making mistakes, as the case might be. So if you find uh, yourself, let's say, doing that sort of thing, then you need just to prepare more. Uh, if you know what's coming up, uh, practice those hymns several times before you actually do them. Uh, in church. And because things tend to come around, uh, at least annually they're going to come around, but they might come around every eight weeks, as the case might be, or or even uh, every day in some cases, uh, then the more you uh, sing these things and go through the cycle of tones, then the less you have to do this practicing, the more familiar it becomes to you. So it just requires work and effort. Well, you are correct there. I could tell you uh, my poor wife has listened to me open up many of your books and listen to many of the audio that you have uh, online uh, and heard me practicing it over and over again. Uh, so that is very good advice for those of you who are interested in learning Serbian chant, uh, which I was not as familiar with when I went to seminary, but I have since fallen in love with the tradition of our Serbian church and our musical chant. 
Uh, I've put a link here below to uh, Dr. Nikola Rasanovich's Serbian Chant website, uh, which I cannot tell you how wonderful a wealth of resources uh, this website is for those who are interested in learning. And actually, I think we might be done with questions for the day. Uh, so Dr. Rasanovich, I thank you so much for taking the time to offer us this lecture today. Thank you very much, Father. Yes, and, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, and, and thank you for all your questions and your comments. Uh, we have a number of people who said hello to you on here uh, from many different places and walks of life that they've known you. So greetings from all of the people on Facebook to you, Dr. Rasanovich. Uh, but to everybody else, going forward, we are going to start offering our Sunday night lectures uh, probably on a every other week basis. So please be sure to follow the Diocese of Eastern America on Facebook for up-to-date information on our next lecture. Uh, we're also going to be posting some good items there as well that would be a nice, joyful feature to your Facebook feed uh, in these times where, unfortunately, not much good news comes across your Facebook feed. Uh, but certainly from our diocese, we'll have some good stuff. So be sure to follow. Once again, thank you, Dr. Rasanovich, and good evening to all of you who were here with us tonight. And God bless.